Welcome to Bear Archery's Hunting 101 podcast, where hunters new and old come to learn and find inspiration from stories of hunts gone by. Everyone is welcome to enjoy the outdoor way of life, and there is no better time to start than right now. So let's head into the great outdoors with your host, Dylan Ray. All right, guys, welcome to Bear Archery's Hunting 101. I've got a episode full of different people. So we've got Gay Bledbetter from Kill and Eat TV. We've got Ryan Schutz from Bear Archery. We've got Warren Holder from Raised Hunting and Aaron Warbritton from The Hunting Public. So before we start talking fun deer hunting, I'll let you guys loose on all your deer hunting stories. Um, give us a quick introduction to yourselves. We'll start with you. Uh, we'll start with you, Ryan. Um, so Ryan Schutz, um, worked for Bear Archery. Uh, boy, it's been, I've, I would say I really, really got into only shooting deer with kind of bows and then back and forth from guns. I started with bows, um, like probably not super young, like 18, 19, and then started to shoot a few with guns. But, um, now it's, it's mostly bows, and then if I'm lucky enough to go with my kids, we do whatever draw, uh, whatever tags we can draw. That's awesome, man. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Aaron, tell us a little bit about yourself, man, what you do there at the Hunting Public. I'm Aaron Warbritton from the Hunting Public. I'm one of the co-owners of the Hunting Public, and uh, we just travel around the country, mostly hunting public land and showing people that you can have a good time in the woods. Absolutely, man. I, I, I gotta say, I love what you guys do, uh, because you show the fun side of hunting and that's what I, I mean, you know, sometimes people just forget hunting and shooting bows is cool and it's fun and it's a good time. And I just love that you guys show that to, to the viewer. So, uh, keep doing what you're doing, man. Uh, Warren, tell us a little bit about yourself, um, and what you guys do at Raised Hunting. Yep. My name is Warren Holder um, from Raised Hunting. We have a TV show that's been on the Outdoor Channel for the last, uh, we're on our seventh season now. We were on Discovery for the last two seasons, and now we're back on the Outdoor Channel. Um, and I'd say our show really embodies more of what it means to hunt and um, the family aspect of hunting and what it means to us and the stories that hunting creates for us to share with our family. That is awesome, man. Gabe Ledbetter, Gabriel Iglesias from Kill and Eat TV. Yeah. Tell us about yourself, man. Yeah, glad to be with you guys today. Uh, Gabe Bloodbetter, I'm one of the hosts of Kill and Eat TV and a lifelong supporter of Bear Archery and uh, also run an outfitting business here in the state of Missouri and have a great time doing that. Yeah, man. It's, uh, it's a wonderful place uh, to go check out Hill Creek Outfitters. Um, before we dive in, I do want to give a quick thank you to our friends over at Bonning. Uh, they make some of the greatest arrow components you could ever have, um, and I'm sure everyone on this phone call would would be appreciative of the fact that they make some incredible bear archery branded products with you know Fred Bear flannel wraps and and the Fred Bear original camo wraps and and uh, so they make some really cool products, especially for bear archery shooters. So go check out Bonning whether you are just looking to build some arrows or whether you need some new components for your arrows. Uh, um, they make everything for you. So Bonding Archery is a good friend of ours, and they make some awesome Bear Archery branded products. Now, I want to ask you, gentlemen, before we dive in, um, I'm going to ask you about some failures, and those are some of my favorite stories uh, because we always learn from failures. So uh, as embarrassing as they might be, I got some embarrassing failure stories, I'll tell you that. Um, but it's all about transparency and learning from those failures. So Gabe, we'll start with you, man. Tell us about your your first deer that you harvested. Man, first deer. Okay, so that that happened in the state of Missouri. And uh, I was probably, I was going to say 12, 13 years old. Man, just sitting on a uh, cut power line in a buddy stand with a friend. And you talk about a life-changing experience, man. It wasn't the biggest deer in the world. Matter of fact, it was uh, extremely small. But uh, I might as well kill a 180 or 200, man, because I was sure pumped up about it. But life-changing experience, man, and I've been hooked ever since. With your dad, brothers, what, who are you with? No, just a, just a friend, just a friend from Missouri uh, that uh, had some property there, and we went out, and uh, things just worked out. We didn't know what we was doing, but 
we we'd got our hunter safeties and we thought we was gonna we thought we was gonna set the world on fire and and we felt like we did when we got that deer on the ground that's awesome man aaron first deer my first deer i was uh sitting between my dad's legs about 12 feet up in a ladder stand that him and i built when i was a kid we uh we just went up to the hardware store and bought a bunch of treated lumber and built the the stands in the yard and then put them up in the summer and then went out and uh it was during gun season in missouri and it was opening morning of gun season i think i was sitting right between my dad's legs and i'd been sitting there about two hours and was whining and ready to go home and then he said hey look here there's some deer coming and i ended up shooting a doe and uh it was pretty amazing it was awesome that is awesome, I was hooked man. from that point forward i was hooked before that even though because the night before i was like a kid you know um on christmas eve i couldn't sleep i was just staring out the window at deer camp with uh you know my dad and all his buddies and enjoying that whole experience and just ready to get to the woods but yeah one i won't forget now you said you were hooked before that and, and i got a question for all all of you um one of the things my dad was was concerned about was after i killed that first deer you know he thought maybe maybe now that you've done it there's no more appeal you know what i mean uh you go out and you've done it and you can say you did it um <laughs> what do you guys do you think that is a real issue and do you how do you think we can as as people who are trying to get others involved in hunting how do you think we can overcome that personally i don't think that's an issue i've maybe i've never ever seen anybody kill their first deer and then was like okay that's cool i'm done but that's just personally what i've seen i'd agree with that i was thinking too like but you know my boys are at the age where they're starting to do a lot of their first on their own they may have seen me do it a few times but um I can tell you my oldest one, it's like now as soon as it's done, he almost starts thinking and preparing for the next one, right? And it's not always the bigger. It says, okay, now I shot when Nebraska were lucky enough to have mule deer and whitetail. So it might be, well, that was a nice mule. Now let's let's do whitetail next. Let's go more after whitetail and be in the river bottom. So I don't, it, I don't know that I see it as a big problem either. That's awesome. Yeah. And for me, that was, that was kind of me. That was my progression was, you know, we did it with a gun. Now let's go to a bow. Um, we did it from a tree stand. Now let's try ground blind. We did it. You know what I mean? I wanted to try and make it harder on myself. Uh, but I do think that we live in a, we live in a society where, where kids are so entertained. It's almost like, well, that was fun. Now let's try something else. Now let's move on to the next thing. So I don't know that it was a problem for any of us growing up. I mean, because we, I mean, I don't know. I can speak for myself. I pretty much grew up outside. So, you know, that was everything I looked forward to. But I think we live in such a fast paced, entertained society that, okay, I did that. It was fun. Now let's go find the next excitement. Um, but I mean, I, you know, we're trying to learn and we're trying to, as, as people who are trying to get kids involved, I think it's something that we're going to, we're going to face as, as these kids are so entertained at home on their cell phones, on their Xbox. Um, I think it's something we'll, we'll face, but, but, uh, Aaron, how do you think we can overcome that? Uh, I would just say involve them in the process of whatever it is that you're doing, uh, for the most part, I should say. Um, I guess I'm. that's kind of my story. I, I started when I was very small going to the woods, and uh, I've talked to Warren's parents, too, and I know he's, you know, their family is very similar um, to ours. Absolutely. Which, from out of the gate, like my earliest memories was going to the woods and helping track deer or, you know, going to deer camp or like I mentioned a while ago, I helped my dad build those tree stands. Um, and he was taking me hunting during bow season when I was six, seven years old. And I was just going out there in a pair of blue jeans and old tennis shoes and just playing around in the woods and learning what a deer track was and which direction it was pointing you know, and all of those things. So I think the more, the more things you can involve kids in, I think sometimes you might lose a kid. If you just take them hunting, they kill the deer. And then that's the end of it. Bingo. You know, cause you, you really need to really need to show them the entire process and, and make it fun for them. Keep it as active as you can. I couldn't agree more. 
I completely agree with that right there. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in right there, and I'll say, man, that's – I'd say that's spot on, man, because as, as parents and uh, influencers, it's up to us a lot. I mean, when you have the choice as a parent to put a uh, a video game controller in your kid's hands or a bare bow, I'm going to take a bare bow all day long, man, because I know if I can just inspire my kids and put them in the right situation to be outdoorsmen and be outdoors women – uh, that they're going to go a long ways in that, you know, so we can set them up to succeed and not to fail. I truly believe. So I'm with you on that right there. Yeah. And if I could just throw it in, Dylan, just speaking from the campsite. So Dylan was asking me before we hopped on here, we do, um, we have a nonprofit site as well called Raise It Full Draw. And we do lots of youth camps. And I think that the biggest part of it is not so much losing them after actually shooting a deer due to technology or anything. I think it's the introduction. You know, it's getting them because we once these kids come to camp and they get a chance to shoot a bow and we take their phones from them and they have to talk to other kids and they um, go through camp. They are absolutely addicted. I mean, you wouldn't believe the, the their picture. Their parents send us pictures of them shooting hundreds of arrows over the course of the summer. Um, and I think that it's just getting them away from the, the technology and all the stuff that entertains them. And, in, and getting them introduced to start with that gives us that gateway to be able to bring them into the outdoors. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with, I agree with what Warren and Aaron both said. Um, I think as, as long as you can get them involved in the process and teach them that hunting is so much more than just the harvest. Hunting is so much more than just the killing of an animal. I think it'll go a long ways in keeping them as lifelong hunters. Um, but but yes, we do have to find ways to get them involved that will keep them entertained and keep them uh, to understand we're working towards something. You know, we're not just out here. We're not out here brush hogging and we're not out here hanging sets and setting cameras just to have fun. We're, we're working towards something. You know, I know we're putting in some long days, but, but we're working towards something and uh and then when they see it all come to to you know that wrap-up point of this is what we worked for i I think it sticks with them man and so i think it's all about yeah getting them involved in the process and teaching them um along the way now warren what was your first deer you harvested man it was actually a mule deer um so i grew up in montana and as aaron was saying you know hunting was i thought it was really funny he said he couldn't sleep I used to have the same exact thing as a kid. I actually couldn't eat breakfast in the mornings because I'd be so excited that it would make me throw up. Uh, And so when I finally, you had to be 12 in Montana to be able to hunt. So when I finally turned 12, I was chomping at the bit to be able to carry my bow. Um, So my dad took me out mule deer hunting and we went, we were just doing spot and stocks. The area we had was a lot of uh, like rock outcropping. So it made for pretty good terrain to be able to sneak up on deer and there was several deer bedded behind this big rock and so my dad and i had snuck up on on these deer and uh a fork and horn was coming right to us and i'm telling you my heart was going through my chest and right then another 110 inch deer or something like that little four by four comes over to kind of run him off and walks up to 16 yards and i shot him made a good shot and watched him fall over uh, and from that day on, I mean, same thing for me, even before I killed one, it was, I was hooked. But after that experience, I was absolutely hooked. And I didn't, I mean, he was not a giant buck, but to me that he was a four by four, he was a, an absolute giant. <laughs> you guys talk like you couldn't sleep before hunting season as a kid. I still can't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Man, there was a time, there was a time I, one time I kid you not, I slept in my boots, full attire, man. I didn't even, nothing about scent free. I just slept in my full gear, man. I didn't even care. (laughs) He was 24 years old when he did that. That's true too. Yep. Ryan, man, first deer. So mine's a little bit different. So in Nebraska, my dad was not really jack of all trades. I'd say that he's fishes walleye and waterfowl hunts. Those were, that was it. Didn't really, uh venture out to deer at all. So I didn't really get that influence. But then as I got into college and all my friends and everything were deer hunting, I decided, all right, I'm doing this. And for whatever reason, I decided that our, that bow hunting was what I was going to do first. So 
my first experience was pretty much alone. I got some permission um, through my father-in-law, and it was right at a field edge, like right where the corn starts to get into kind of the um, ends, and then there was this, this little tree row. So we put a put a sand up there, got it all hung about a week or two before um, I knew I would be back to be able to hunt. And um, I was a little bit, I, there was a few deer, father-in-law said there was three good deer there. And I got in the stand and I'm like, I'm shooting whatever comes by. I don't even care. I'm getting a deer. <laughs> I am getting a deer today. And um, it was not quite as lucky as the other was a little, it was a, four corn not a big deer at all came by he took one i could tell it was a buck and then he took one step into the path and um ended up not making my best a shot but got him down before i could get down from the stand um probably about a 140 walked the exact same path as that deer i couldn't care as far as i'm concerned he was (laughs) 280 inches if he was an inch it was such a big deal um and of course, it would never be that big, but I was so excited, and I was I was older, but I even had a harder time, I think, holding it together being older than I see my sons do now. Don't you guys? Don't you guys almost kind of miss that mentality, though? I mean, we get so focused on trophy hunting that sometimes I just miss the pure joy and excitement of shooting a doe. Now, don't get me wrong; I get pretty pumped when I shoot a doe, but. Sometimes I just miss, and I wish we could, I could just go back and and just relive that childhood excitement of whatever I see I'm shooting. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh yeah, no doubt. But there's something fun about about chasing after the biggest one and and trying to shoot a bigger one every year too. Um. Now, from that first deer hunt on to now, what's the biggest lesson you've learned as a deer hunter, and how is that? How has that fed into your preparation for this upcoming deer hunt? There's a lot I, of information between that time. <laughs> Boy, I'm telling you, yeah. it's hard trying to think what's the what's the most important thing I've learned. That's I, a good question right there. I I could say for me, I pretty much got in that stand fairly cold, meaning I didn't know the property or the layout of things, not like I do now, right? Like I think a lot of us, I wouldn't just go to a stand or a spot or a scan now without looking like Onyx maps and seeing where, how the, you know, how everything lays out from a top version or scouting the way that I would today i just didn't do back then i feel like the preparation now i know that my success rate will go up if i put in a lot more prep than i used to absolutely if there was one thing that i would say that i've learned the most that i carry into every deer season it's um trying to truly learn the animals and understand their behavior and and why they do things and when they're going to do them and uh and how i can capitalize on that i think once you can have a good understanding of animal behavior and and their tendencies i think that it gives you a huge advantage um not only you know to be able to uh get into a position to get a shot but also actually going through with the shot you know for instance i can tell you right now when i was 12 if I wasn't really going to pay attention to the deer if he was alert or not. And I'm at it and I get a shot, you know, I'm going to put my pin right where, right on his lungs, right where I feel like it's supposed to be. Um, as to opposed to now, if I know that I got a deer that's 30 yards and he's alert, I'm going to aim low anticipating him to duck. Um, so I think trying to understand their behavior and always trying to learn every time I go out, what may have caused a deer to do something, uh, would definitely be the most, probably the most important thing. Um, but there's a lot of time between my first year and now. A lot of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I'm telling you. And I would agree with you, man. Uh, that that was that that was probably the biggest lesson I've taken. You know, growing up, you know, we'd be grunting and rattling in September, and uh, <laughs> you know, I just over the years we've had to learn. There's certain times to do certain things, and there's certain yeah. times not to do other things. Um, so yeah, I would say that that's probably one of the biggest lessons I've taken away is trying to understand the deer behavior, what they're doing yeah. during certain times of the year, when they might be doing other things. I mean, uh, when they'll be when they'll be hitting food plots, so on and so forth. Um, so that's, yeah, that's probably one of the biggest yeah. lessons I've learned too. 
And I, I'd I'd say for me, and you guys probably jump on board with this, but uh, man, patience is a virtue, uh, and more so more so in the woods than anywhere else. You know, uh, we were talking about the excitement as we were kids. You know, you just want to hunt. And it, it took me a while to learn that sometimes it's, you know, you got to be patient. You know, you, you, you set up a new stand at a new property and you just want to hunt it. You don't necessarily pay attention to the wind. But, you know, that's one thing I learned really quick is you can, uh, you can mess a spot up really fast if you're not patient. So for me, man, patience was a huge thing. Uh, not, you know, just knowing when the right time to hunt is. Yeah. I uh, I don't remember if it was you or if it was one of your brothers uh, last year, but w- it was like November 6th. We had a snowstorm coming in, and uh, I was talking to one of you. It was either you or Grant, and uh, he said, oh, I'm not going hunting in the morning. Uh, I said, well, why not? Mm-hmm. He said, well, I don't have a, a good wind for any of my spots here in Kansas. And I was like, oh, dude, like <laughs> that takes some stinking – that takes some self-control there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you just don't know. You know, if you got a target buck, if you're that type of hunter, and then – you go in there with the wrong wind that you may blow your only shot you had at that deer. So, I mean, for you young hunters out there, uh, that's one thing, you know, get out there and hunt most definitely, but, uh, pick the right time to do it, you know, cause patience can be a virtue. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, before I ask you the next question, I do want to give another quick thank you to our friends at Rocky Mountain Outfitters in Colorado. Uh, they've been guiding since 2011. Uh, they've got elk hunts and they've got bear hunts. They do some sheep hunts and uh, they do backcountry hunts. They have some awesome fishing. Um, they do private land hunts and high country horseback hunts. Uh, so really just a, a all around awesome outfitter for whatever you're looking to do elk hunting wise. So if you're planning on, on trying to get out this, this fall and go elk hunting, Rocky mountain outfitters in Colorado is absolutely an incredible place to go hunt. Um, now onto the fun stuff, share with us one of your funniest (laughs) failure stories you've had in the deer woods. Ooh, funniest. Hmm. Oh, you've got lots. I can tell. <laughs> I've probably got too many. <laughs> <There's> a, <laughs> I would agree. There's a lot of failures involved <laughs> with the hunting public <laughs> when it comes to chasing deer on public land all over the place. Um, <laughs> yeah, a few years ago, Jake and I, we were actually, all of us were headed in to hunt one morning, late season. It was pretty cold, and we were walking across a, a pretty shallow creek i mean it was only a few feet deep but there was a good crust of ice on it and we had to cross that ice to get over there and he he was the last one in the group and fell through and oh busted through the ice and went he it's only two feet deep so he just went in far enough to get his to get his boot wet (laughs) but it was it was all on film so (laughs) we were watching back through that the other day and he was just (laughs) just scootering around across the top of that ice and all of a sudden went out from underneath him and he had to hunt the rest of the morning with a freezing wet boot. You got, you guys got that posted up on social media. Yeah, It's on there. Oh Oh, yeah. And there was another one. I was packing out a Turkey once in Tennessee and I, my friend Zach uh, Kurzieski was filming it and we were doing some staged video of it or something, you know, filming in slow motion. And I was walking across (laughs) a crossing in a little Creek and there was a bunch of moss on the rocks and I hit that moss just right. My legs flew, flew right out from underneath me, and that turkey went flying, and it's all in 120 frames per second. <laughs> so it was super slow. Oh, man. Dude, I've been there. I've been there duck hunting before. Uh, lose your footing, and the waders fill up with water. And, and uh, you know, I was only standing in about, oh, four foot of water. But in that moment, you're thinking, well, this is it. I'm done. My waiters are filling up, you know, they're, they're weighing me down. I'm, I, I'm not going to make it out of here. Um, it's a scary <laughs> thing, but it sure is. It sure is funny when it happens. Yeah. I'm telling you. Who else has got one for me? I've got one. There is a lot of lessons learned on this hunt. I was staying with a friend and it, it, we kind of decided, well, let's, he's like, I've been seeing these really big bucks. And I'll be honest. I was like, ah, I don't know if you're big and my big are the same. But we'll go, and no tree stands, no nothing, just planning to, to spot and stock. And we go to a place, and I just I should have took it more serious. You learn back to patience as a virtue, right? So I didn't have much back then. And we uh, 
get set up kind of it it was a funnel there was all kinds of scrapes that we had seen there but this was like eight o'clock in the morning we're already pretty late it was really cold and so he kind of went by one group of trees and then i we played the wind just a little bit and there was kind of a whole bunch of these down logs. I'm like, well, I'll, I'll get there. So I kind of put one, one foot pretty firm on the ground and then kind of my back knee and leg, um, against this, this other log, which I thought was pretty sturdy, giving away what's going to happen later in the story. Well, out of nowhere, all of a sudden you hear grunts, almost like it's another hunter. You're like, no way. Is this really going to happen? There's two of us on the ground here. Oh, yeah. I bet he's grunting every couple of seconds. Um, and it's just, it's more frequent, more frequent. A doe pops out of the woods, um, basically walks right in between us. I'm like, no way. He grunts again. Pretty good deer for, for Nebraska comes out. Just a straight four by four comes out and it's like 18 yards and i'm like well that's good enough and i try to draw the bow back and the backlog just completely gives way i fall completely over the bow goes over my head next thing you know i'm just laying on my on my back so yeah i wasn't prepared for a deer to come out <laughs> my own fault i uh one time i was hunting and uh a doe stepped out and I decided I was going to shoot a doe that morning and a doe stepped out and I went to, to, to draw back on her and my release halfway through my draw broke like it, it like the internal screw or something. I don't know, but this release broke. And so I fired an arrow and I was only at half draw. So, I mean, the arrow just lobbed through the air and it actually ended up hitting the deer. That arrow went and hit the deer, uh, obviously didn't penetrate or anything, just bounced off of her and she just ran off. And, uh, I was actually, I was gone on this hunt for, for, uh, oh, I think four days, maybe I was going to be hunting. And, uh, so I go and after that hunt, I climb down and I go and, and find, and I was hunting with my brother-in-law and, uh, he says, Hey, I heard you shoot. Did you kill anything? I said, well, I shot, but, uh, sort of shot, but nothing died for sure. And, uh, so I went back to my bag and, and I had lost my, my backup release. So for four days, I, I just. I just went and filmed my brother-in-law because I had, uh, I had broke one release and lost another. So, um, now I carry a third backup release. <laughs> <laughs> Can't have too many of those things. Warren, what do you got for us, man? I don't know if it's a personal one, but, uh, my mom and I were going hunting one day. Now don't be was... telling stories on your mom. Oh, I have to. Though. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so you know, it was cold. It was really cold, you know, so we both look like marshmallows and she's got her bow and I'm carrying the camera and, and we get to just a small Creek. It's probably, it can't, it's probably like three feet across or so. And, uh, and so I didn't really think about it at all, you know, and I just jump across the Creek and, uh, turn around and wait on, on mom and, uh, and she jumps and trips and she smacks right face first onto the end of the bank. She didn't use her arms or anything, just like Superman dived right into the bank. And so I start, <laughs> I'm like almost crying, laughing. And I can't stop laughing. And then she just looks up at me and she says, I could have broke my freaking neck. And so mad. And that just made it 10 times funnier. And then, so then it was funny after that. And then she was laughing <laughs> with me and we sat in the blind for three hours. And it was one of those things where, you know, you just couldn't help it. You just see it again in your head and just start busting up laughing. So we didn't, we didn't see anything the whole trip, but I'm sure that's because uh, we were about crying laughing the whole time. It was fun. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is a good one, man. Um, Gabe, I'm going to start asking about um, that deer you killed in, in 2018. Um, and I came out and helped you get it and take pictures and everything. Tell yeah. us the story of that buck, man, because that was a pretty cool story. Man, uh, I'll tell you what. So that was that was a long season in Kansas. Um, you know, I, I'm a bow hunter at heart, but when you've had a rough season, man, I'll, I'll pick I'll pick up the rifle when it comes around, which it rolls around in, uh, in December in Kansas. And so I had already I already had some oh I think seventy something sets by then. So I was ready for a rifle. And uh, it wasn't long into that hunt, man. I'm sitting on a cut bean field, and 
you know, a doe comes out of this corner down there, and it wasn't long after, man, that that uh, that deer comes strolling out. I think he went 160, 170, somewhere in there. Uh, and, and dude, I'll tell you what, that was, that was the cap off on a, on a tough season, but man, that, that, that season right there means more to me than a lot of them just because I worked for it. You know what I'm saying? I worked for it and you got to experience that with me. It was a good time. It was a good time. Yeah. And that was a, that was an incredibly beautiful deer, man. Um, incredibly beautiful. Warren, you shot this giant, uh, was it last year in 2019? Uh, yeah. Yep. Dude. First off, gorgeous deer, man. Gorgeous deer. Thanks. That was a really cool deer. He was, uh, the coolest thing about him in, in my opinion was that he was eight and a half years old. Um, and we had trail camera pictures of him for five years. So that was pretty cool to be able to, you know, chase him for five, five years. Mm. And he was a very, very smart deer. I, I, People tell me all the time, oh, you won that one. And I'm like, no, that deer kicked my can for five years. Um, but October 22nd, it all came together. He, he walked out to, he literally came from somewhere I'd have never expected that he'd come from. Though I only had one stand on the place where I felt like I even had a shot at him. So I just kept sitting there. And uh, every time I had the wind right, I would just sit there. And um, he comes from my right which I was expecting him to come from in front of me, which is there's a big ditch there that separates it. Well, he walks from, comes from my right. And really the only place that he can walk is, is right underneath me. And I had this stand, uh, my cameraman's, they hate this stand because it's like 30 feet up and it's more like probably 40 off of the back where they're, where they're sitting. Um, because it's just a, it's just a, it's a bald tree. So there's not much cover there to be able to hide you. So I put the stand way up. And so that's such a, um, such a severe angle that I needed him to come out at least 15 yards to be able to feel like I could make the shot. Well, he doesn't, he comes right underneath me. I'm looking at him through the stand. So then instead of him going, to the left, which is what he was doing, he cuts back to the right. And so now I'm in a really bad spot because he's literally right underneath me and there's no wind. And so I'm, I'm having to move my whole body from the left all the way back around to the right to try to be able to shoot him with him at, you know, four or five yards, really, really paying attention. And uh, thank God he comes up to the right a little bit and gave me enough time that I was able to get turned around and, and then I was able to shoot him at eight yards. It's a good thing it wasn't any further because I did, I was shaking like a leaf. I'd have had a hard time making the shot. That's awesome, man. You know, and, and we practiced shooting, you know, 60, 70, 80 yards. I, I don't remember the exact um I don't remember the exact distances or the exact percentages, but it's something like eighty percent of Pope and Young animals are shot within like seventeen yards. Oh which yeah. is just kind of crazy to think. Well, we just did the numbers on um, I can't remember exactly what they are right now, but uh, my dad and I did the numbers once. So if we had our family and, and all the hunts that we've been a part of, we have way over 100 kills. I don't know, probably two, maybe 300. And uh, and we're now at a place where we're able to average them out. And our average on elk was like 17 yards. And our average on deer was like 21. And antelope was like 25 that's awesome turkey that's a good six <laughs> that's a, that's a good distance on antelope man yeah if you hunt them out of water over water you you know it's a myth when people tell you that you have to shoot 60 70 yards at, at antelope that's not true you can shoot them if you set your blind up right you know you give them a little time to get used to it um you can shoot antelope at 25 yards 30 yards no problem i've even stalked them and shot them still kept it 40 and under that's awesome man aaron and ryan i want you to share with me not necessarily your biggest deer but your most memorable deer hunt wh wh which hunt meant the most to you oh that'd be hard to pick just one um ryan if you got one that you're thinking of go ahead man yeah i've got one so i don't in my introduction i probably didn't um give a good background but my background obviously is designing and making and selling products so um 
each hunt to me becomes a little special depending on the item I'm using. So sometimes I've been lucky enough, you know, it might be the only one of a kind bow that I'm able to use and to be able to harvest an animal with something like that tends to to mean a lot because you know, maybe I didn't build it, but I was part of the team that did, right? So there's one particular hunt a few years back. Um, it was on the North Platte River and a landowner that I've known forever. Uh, we don't generally get to hunt together. It just seems like it never works out that we can hunt at the same time. Well, there's this one spot on his property that's fairly difficult to get to. So we tend to like to get in there together. And then once you get there, it's big enough to break apart. So on this particular day, it was, I remember how cold it was. It was really cold and he didn't want to get too far from where I was. So he was in a two man ladder stand. Um, and I went to kind of, we called it the pinch point. So there is a scrape tree, really close to a ladder stand and they like to walk almost straight underneath the sand at times. So you had to usually be on your game. Um, so this particular day I was hunting with a bow that we had just designed that nobody else had. It, and I was the only one in the field with this bow. We were still like proving stuff out on it. Um, so it was, you know, I wanted to shoot something nice, but it also was like one of my, it was it was kind of my baby so uh really good four by four comes out um and like like a 140 four by four which is a pretty good four by four in nebraska and he came out he started at 60 yards and of course not coming down the normal path at all not even coming close to where they normally would and it got lucky enough the landowner had seen him too and um he was you know, after hindsight, he was always wondering if I'd shoot it or not. And I was like, oh, he ended up uh, almost doing, he started six yards straight away from me. And then he almost did like a half moon, um, getting closer and closer. So next thing you know, he's like 45 and then 40. And then I kind of had to guess. I was like, I'm pretty sure he's going to come right in between um there's these two kind of saplings about 30 yards and i was like well let's we'll give it a go so that was about my best chance to draw the way that he came in was completely open so i didn't have not near the places that normally you could draw so i was pretty nervous about how smooth i was going to do it well anyway he he gets really close i draw um and it all pretty much works out really well from there um made a good shot didn't go very far at all um but what was so exciting for me was you know getting to use it with with equipment that wasn't even out there yet so great deer and it was great that the landowner was there with me so um he was pretty excited he knew it was one of my prototype bows i was using too so it was it was a really good moment i like it that's awesome, man. Yeah, I've never even thought about I've never even thought about how that might have felt to shoot a deer with something that you designed and created. Um, what's what's been your favorite bow that you've ever you've ever designed? Um, God, it's pro it's it's probably going to be boring because it's probably one of our newer ones. Um, but right now, I really really enjoy shooting the Divergent EKO. And I would say the reason I probably like it the best is everybody's different. So I like a short bow. I'm pretty short. So um, I'm usually a 26 and a half inch draw. So I have a short draw. So I like a kind of a smaller bow. I, I think I can get away with quite a bit um, of geometry that way since I'm not huge. And I really like the let off. Um, I like to be able to draw something and draw way ahead of time like in that story even and not feel fatigued at all so having that 90 percent cam in, in especially in the bear line has been something that we've never been able to do so i'm pretty proud of that one there's we have another bow in the line the status that does that as well but something about the divergent just fits me very well well the eko cam is one of the greatest cams in my opinion that i've ever shot um, so you should be proud of that one. I, uh, I love, I'm shooting the status and I, I absolutely love, love this bow. I've, I got to shoot, um, two hogs with it and, uh, 
you know, I'm excited to take it out this fall. And it's just, it's been a great bow. I've, I've really enjoyed shooting it. I've enjoyed, I think I'm running mine at like 80% let off. And, and I just enjoy that. It, it's good to have options. It's good to make a bow work for you. Uh, my most memorable deer hunt was a small, small, uh, Arkansas, Southern Arkansas doe. And I actually shot it with my rifle, but what was so special to me was I shot this on my grandparents' place and uh, I shot it with my dad on Thanksgiving night and I shot it, uh, with a rifle and I got to take it back up to my grandparents' house and show my grandma. And, uh, you know, it's always just been something that I know, uh, when she's no longer with us, that that memory is always going to be with me of getting to hunt that deer on her place, take it and show her. And, and, uh, you know, I think, I think I even took her some meat afterwards. And so I just know that that memory is always going to be with me of getting to, uh, to share that with my grandma and show that to my grandma and tell her the story about it. And so, you know, it doesn't always have to be a big buck to be a good story. And that's what, that's what I love about, about deer hunting is, uh, there's just so many good times and so much fun things, um, that we can pull from it. Uh, have you thought of one yet, Aaron? Yeah, I would say one of my favorite memories was, uh, uh, I think it was the first buck that I shot with my bow. I shot him out of a, out of a ladder stand that my uncle built before I was born or, well, it might've been before I was born. It was really old. <laughs> it was, it was getting <laughs> to the point where it was like, man, we should probably think about replacing this thing. But, uh, my cousin and my best friend growing up had shot his first deer with a bow, his first buck with a bow the year before that he's a year older than me too. So he, he got a chance to go bow hunting that year, hunted a bunch and finally killed a buck out of this stand. And that was really cool. And then the next year, uh, opening week of archery season in Missouri, they let me go sit that stand. We called it old faithful. And I had sat there a bunch of times with them and watched all these deer come by it. So I was just so excited to go sit there that night and ended up, um, shooting a buck a lot like Ryan's story a while ago, where the first buck that showed up and came by, I shot him and he took off running and I and I saw the arrow disappear right behind the shoulder and I heard him run off and crash and I immediately started getting down out of the tree to go get my cousin he was across the farm on the other side and about the time I got to the bottom of the stand I looked up and there was a real nice buck staring at me about 20 yards away he was on that same trail but yeah I remember I remember going up to my cousin and he was in the stand that night still. I mean, this is still daylight. Like I didn't know what I was supposed to do. I didn't know if I was supposed to wait around or what. I mean, I was 11 years old, something like that. And I was running over there whistling the whole way. And I got there to him and told him I'd shot one. And he was like, man, you better shut up. There could be a deer come by any second. But, uh, that was a cool, that was a real cool hunt. Got to share it with my whole family. And that was an experience that I won't forget. That's awesome, man. Uh, before we go, what is the, the deer hunt this year that you're most excited about? Probably Pennsylvania public land in uh, third week of October for us. That's, that's one that should be a lot of fun. What makes that so special? Uh, there's just a lot of people, a lot of hunters in Pennsylvania. There's a rich tradition of, of hunting up there. A lot like it, a lot like it, it is in Michigan and Wisconsin. Uh, not to say other states are, aren't like that. I mean, Missouri's like that too. Got rich deer camp tradition in Missouri. Uh, but PA is, has got a lot of hunters and a lot of public land. So, uh, I'm, I've turkey hunted up there in the past and had a blast and I'm just looking forward to, to deer hunting up there for the first time this fall. That's awesome, man. Uh, now is your whole crew going or is it just you or? Uh, no, it'll be our crew. It'll be a big collaboration. We'll be, will be uh, it's what we call the public land challenge that we have every year to be us and then dan infault from the hunting beast and jeff sturgis from whitetail habitat solutions uh, and we may end up with one other crew there uh by the time it's all said and done with but just a bunch of just a, a bunch of hunters getting together and going and tackling a new piece of public land and trying to show folks how we're doing it and show them how much fun you can have going out on public land that's just the whole mission of the the trip but it should be it should be a good time that's awesome man warren what what hunt are you excited about this year man um i'm excited about all of them if we're going this deer it's got to be iowa whitetails in the rut I just the there's just 
something about hearing a buck coming through the leaves in Iowa and just not knowing what's on his head that, you know, just gets my heart absolutely surging. But I guess if there's one um, hunt that I'm most excited about is I'm going to be going to New Mexico for elk in September and I've never hunted New Mexico for anything. And uh, I'm just super stoked to be going there. I think it's going to be a, a really fun hunt. Yeah, I would say for me, much like Iowa, um, hunting Kansas in the rut is just, it's my favorite thing in the world. Uh, and this year I've got a buddy coming. Uh, one of our cameramen is coming uh, from Arkansas to hunt the rut with me for a week. And uh, I'm just excited to get to share that with him. And, and uh, you know, coming from Arkansas, he's a young man. And uh, last year was the first year he ever got to come and experience Kansas, period. Um, and, you know, just seeing his face when we saw some of those Kansas deer, uh was incredible but now i get to see him experience kansas rut which is just an incredible time and so i'm excited for him to come and, and hunt with me and and uh just share that with him for a week and so uh ryan what about you man um mine's mule deer in nebraska but mine's got a little bit of a twist so um this is the first year that my oldest son wants to do one with a bow so that's what i'm looking for looking forward to oh cool yeah, that'll be awesome, man. That'll be awesome. Hopefully he gets one. It'd be great. We'll, we're trying spot and stock, and it's tough, but eh, we've got energy. It'll it'll be fun. Nice. Now, I'll tell you this. I'll tell you this. If he kills one, you and him are both coming on the podcast to tell the story about it. <laughs> I'm sure I, if we get one done, father and son, that I'm sure it'll be a good story. Yeah, I can't wait to hear about it. There might be some parts that we have to edit out. <laughs> There always is. <laughs> I can't wait to hear about it, man. But uh, guys, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I hope that you have a fantastic deer season and a fantastic hunting season all around. Before we go, go uh, I do want to give a quick thank you to Selway Archery. Uh, they make some of the finest products for recurves. Um, their quivers are absolutely just incredible. Um, so go check out Selway Archery. If you are a traditional hunter, they are the best in the business um, for making some quivers. And they have some awesome Bear Archery branded quivers. So go check out Selway Archery. Guys, thank you for joining us, and I hope you guys will have a great week and a wonderful deer season. Thanks, Thanks. you too. Appreciate it.